Now, as howling winds echo across the snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, the Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the delicious cereal shot from guns, in cooperation with the Mutual Broadcasting System, presents by special recording, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, breaking a trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. And King on your husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. And the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Our adventure will begin in just a moment. Quote from an employee. I'd give my eye teeth for a worker who's steady, reliable, efficient, and trained to do the job, end quote. Well, there is a new source of workers just like that. Men and women ready, willing, and able to do just the kind of job you'd want them to do. They are the physically handicapped who have overcome their disabilities through vocational rehabilitation. So, Mr. Employer, you're bound to find someone who fits that job opening of yours to a T. How do you obtain a trained disabled worker? Just call your local vocational rehabilitation office. Find out for yourself what survey after survey has proved. Handicapped workers are specially prepared, steady, reliable, efficient. They can match the work performance of the able-bodied any day and often surpass it. You'll find it's good business to hire the handicapped. This message is brought to you as a public service. Lumber was selling for $200 a thousand feet in Dawson. And early in the spring, Bert McHugh contracted with the Yukon Trading Company to cut a million feet of its timber on the upper Yukon and the Niora. The logs were to be lashed into huge rafts and floated down the river to Jim Clark's sawmill, which had been leased by the company. It was specified in McHugh's contract that a bonus of $10,000 would be paid for complete delivery by August 15th. But Bert ran into difficulties. For he had a powerful enemy in Dawson, a man named Corrigan, who was determined that Bert would never earn his bonus. <laughs> At daybreak on the morning of oh. August 1st, Jim Clark, who managed the sawmill for the company, was wakened by a loud pounding on the door of his cabin. Who is it? Bert McHugh. Come on, get up. Oh, it's the middle of the night. I have three more rafts of logs that's tied up in the dark. I'll be with you as soon as I put on some clothes. Okay. A few minutes later, the sawmill owner opened the door, still buttoning his shirt. The two men started for the waterfront. You're in an all-fired hurry to get out of town. Well, I have five men with me. Duke Curtis and Pierre Renault among them. If those two should happen to run into Corrigan or any of his gang, it'd be a fight. That might suit Corrigan, but it wouldn't suit me. You're not even a waste of time. You don't have much of that left, do you? What time? To deliver all the logs you're supposed to. Fulfill your contract. So I have two weeks. If I bring in six more rafts like the ones we brought in tonight, the job will be done. And I'll win the booming. Well, can you do it? I think so. Things have been going well enough at camp ever since I got rid of Silk Manning. You still figure Corrigan hired him to make trouble. Yeah, of course. I don't get it. That's why should Corrigan want you to lose your bonus. Because he knows that if I lose it, I won't make any money on the contract. He saw that you because you got the contract and he didn't? Yeah, he only fit on it because he didn't want me to get it. Oh, it's personal between you two then. It's gotten to be. But there's more to it than that. Here we are. Tied to the dock in front of the sawmill, there were three huge log rafts. Seated on the edge of the dock just above them, there were five husky young men, dressed in flannel shirts, corduroy trousers, and lumberman's boots. Come on in the office, Bert. I'll give you your receipt. Yeah, yeah. Right. Plenty of logs in those rafts. Yeah. Must have taken some real navigating to get them out of the Niora and into the Yukon. Yeah, no better men in the Yukon at the sweeps than Pierre and Duke. Yeah, you're not so bad yourself, I hear. No, I was lucky to find such a crew. And if I pull this deal off, I mean to make it up to them. Yeah, there isn't one of them who wouldn't die for you, Bert. 
Well, I certainly don't want that to happen. And now, let's see. Received by the Clark Lumber Company as agent for the Yukon Trading Company from Burt McHugh, three rafts containing approximately a... This footage I'm putting down is subject to final check, you know. I know. Yeah. But you're yeah. underestimating, if anything. Six yeah. more laps like these and the job will be done. Yeah. There you are. There's your receipt. Now, you. Hey, Bert. Trouble. Uh, what do you mean, trouble? Half a dozen guys come along the water front. It looks like Corrigan in the lead. Big guy, anyway. Come on. I'll see you later, Jim. All right. Hey, come, come along where? We're getting into our canoes and taking off. Oh, no, Bert. I say yes. See you see who's coming, Bert. I see. It's too late to leave now. He's here. Hey! I'll do the talking here. Oh, we miss you. So you brought in some more rats, monsieur. It looks that way, doesn't it, Corrigan? And this time we had a pleasant trip. No shots from the bank. No tugs trying to ram us. A very pleasant trip. You've been saying things I don't like, Miss you. Such as? Silk Manning here says that when you fired him, you accused him of taking money from me to make trouble at your camp. Is that right, Silk? Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, Duke, let's go. You're a coward, Buster. What do you think of that? Did you hear what I said? Yeah, I heard. And there's only one answer to a word like that. Oh, oh, are you a thief? Let him have it, man! As soon as the first blow was struck, Jim Clark, who had been watching from the doorway of his office, took off around the corner of the building, ran down the street to the Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters. There he found Sergeant Preston. The sergeant returned with him to the waterfront. On the dock, the sergeant stopped for a moment to size up the situation. There were half a dozen individual fist fights. The Northwest Mounted commanded great respect in Dawson. If the men hadn't been so occupied with each other, the sight of the sergeant's red coat would have been enough to put an end to the battle. As it was, he had to break up each of the individual fights. That's enough. In the name of the law, stand over there with Pierre and Silver. When he had finished, 12 men stood in a row, most of them nursing cuts or bruises. I'm not going to ask you how this started. You'll make your explanation to the judge. The judge? What? Court convenes at 9 o'clock. Until then, you're going to jail. Come on, let's get moving. Uh, we'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Say, kids, which would you rather do? Read about your favorite baseball team in the papers, or see a game on the screen, or be right in the ball bar, yelling for the players on your team, eating hot dogs, drinking soda pop, and having the time of your life. Golly, nothing beats the fun of the ballpark. Come out to the game now as guest of a major or minor league team. Walk right through the gate without paying a cent if you are 12 years or younger, and bring mom or dad or another paying adult relative. You can now get a free baseball ticket right inside a package of Quaker Pop Wheat or Quaker Pop Rice or Muffet Shredded Wheat. Or buy Quaker Paco 10 and get two free baseball tickets. Names of teams and dates are on every ticket. Get in on the fun. Right away, get a free baseball ticket package of Quaker Pop Wheat or Rice, Muffet Shredded Wheat, or Quaker Paco 10. Bring the whole family to the ball game. You'll all have a picnic. Now to continue. At nine o'clock, the men stood before Judge Hall. Hey, Corrigan, Bert McHugh, you could it. Yes, yes, yes. All charged with disorderly conduct. Are you guilty or not guilty? Well, Judge, it was this way. Guilty Please. or not guilty? I plead not guilty, and so do my friends. McHugh and his thugs attacked us. Did you, McHugh? I struck the first blow, sir, but not until Corgan had called me a coward. You plead provocation, eh? Yes, sir. Did you call McHugh a coward, Corgan? Well, I might have said he was acting like a coward. Why was he acting like a coward? I had some things I wanted to settle with him, and he wouldn't listen to them. He ordered his men to get into that connection, and Court finds the defendants equally guilty. The usual sentence for disorderly conduct is a $10 fine or three days on the wood pile. Uh, Your Honor, I'll gladly pay the fine, but I have work to do. I think the sentence would be the wood pile. Well, that's very really interesting, Corrigan. The court is pleased to take your suggestion. For you and your men, the wood pile. For McHugh and his, $10 a fine. Hey, now, wait a minute. Take him away, Sergeant. First door to your right, men. McHugh. 
As soon as you say you're fine, I'd like to see you in my office. You won't keep me long, Sergeant. A few minutes. Sure thing. I'll be there. Judge has no right. He can't set them free for a measly $10 and then... Keep your voice down, Corrigan, or you'll get 10 more days for contempt of court. I'll move along. But look, Sergeant, you go. When Bert entered the sergeant's office... Sit down, Bert. Yes, sir. I've been having a talk with Jim Clark and with the manager of the Yukon Trading Company. Uh, about me? About your contract with the company. If you fulfill it in two weeks, you receive a bonus? Yeah, by the 15th, that's right. But you told Clark that Corrigan's been doing everything in his power to make you lose the bonus. Uh, I have no proof, Sergeant. I'm making no accusations. No proof and no proof. I'd like to know the reason for Corrigan's attitude. That goes back to last spring, Sergeant. I own a bench claim on the Dominion. Huh? The gravel's rich, but... In order to get the gold out, I'll have to install a pipeline and pump. There's no water up there. With the other machinery that's needed, it'd take about $10,000 to develop the claim. Corrigan tried to buy the claim last spring. I refused to sell. And tried to borrow money to develop it. Corrigan made that impossible. He has plenty of influence around here. I know he has. I couldn't borrow, so I decided to make the money I needed. The Yukon Trading Company wanted their timber cut. I entered a low bid and got the job. Your bid was so low that you'll make nothing at all unless you get the bonus for quick delivery. That's right. I'm just about break even. I'll be just where I was last spring, and Corrigan knows that. But you have a good chance of collecting if there's no interference with your work. Yes, Sergeant. Well, all I want to point out to you, Bert, is that the Northwest Mounted is here for your protection. You feel you need protection? Oh, I wouldn't say that. A little good luck with our cutting, a little good luck in getting the rafts down here. We'll make out all right. I hope you do. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Sergeant. McHugh and his men returned to their camp. But after they had served their sentence chopping wood, Corrigan and his men also left town. This didn't escape the sergeant's attention. And as the days passed and no more logs were delivered to the sawmill, Sergeant asked to investigate conditions at the lumber camp. Permission was granted. And with King as his companion, the sergeant paddled up the Yukon to Niora Creek. It was dusk when the mouth of the Niora was reached. And as soon as they started up the stream, King became restless. <laughs> a strong, steady breeze was blowing from the south, and King's nose was turned toward the south bank of the stream. The sergeant watched him closely, and then raised his eyes to the darkening sky. A faint haze seemed to be settling over it, and the sergeant read the sign correctly. Fire, King. Forest fire. <laughs> Sergeant beached his canoe near a game trail that ran down to the water's edge. And then he and King started up it. The heavily wooded ground rose gradually for over a mile until finally they reached a ridge that ran parallel to the Niora. Now, in spite of the gathering dusk, they could actually see smoke. It was coming from a gully on the south side of the ridge. Sergeant and King hurried toward it. At the bottom of the cut, hundreds of dry pines were blazing. And whipped by the south wind, the flames were creeping steadily toward the top of the ridge. King, unless that fire stops right here, the whole forest and head of the river will burn. <laughs> the lumber camps on the banks of the creek in a direct line with this ravine. We can't stop the fire alone, boy. We must get the help of McHugh and his men. <laughs> the sergeant and King ran down the sloping floor of the forest toward the lumber camp. The lights were glowing through the trees when they reached it. And the sergeant headed straight for the mess cabin. McHugh! Sergeant Preston, I'm glad to see you. I have good news. I'm afraid I don't. All that timber's cut and waiting to be made into rats. It may never be made into rats. What? It may never leave the banks of the Niora. I told you my news wasn't good. What is it? What's wrong? Fire. 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 Other side of the ridge. So far, it's in a ravine, but the wind's driving it this way. If it jumps the ridge... The whole forest, the camp. Your logs, everything this side of the creek will burn. Can it be stopped? If we hurry, tell your men to get spades and picks. Dig a trench across the top of the ravine and set a backfire. You heard the sergeant, men. Hop to it. As the men hurried through the forest after the sergeant, they heard the sound of many feet to the right and the left of them. Wild animals, large and small, were retreating before the deadly threat of fire. Last, the top of the ravine was reached. The lumbermen began digging a wide, shallow trench under the sergeant's direction. It was pitch dark now, and the smoke swept up from the ravine in choking clouds. But a ribbon of bare ground began to stretch across the top of the ravine. Then suddenly there was a cry from down the slope, a human cry. Sergeant, you hear that? Sounded like a man. It was. He's a goner. We may be able to get him out. Ping. <laughs> Sergeant pointed down the ravine. Find him, boy. Find him. <laughs> Obediently, King started down the slope with a sergeant directly behind him. The smoke was thick, 
the crackle of flames seemed to be directly ahead when King finally stopped. The man was lying face down on the ground. The sergeant turned him over. Silk Manning. My ankle. I swear to that I can't walk. No, but you can set fires. The sergeant lifted Silk in his arms and trudged back up the slope to the ridge. Silk was unconscious when the top was reached. The sergeant turned him over to Pierre. Take him to the spring, Pierre. A little cold water will bring him around. When he comes to, give me a call. I want to find out what he was doing in that ravine. We, oui, Sergeant, I call you. All right, that's it, man. The trench had been finished. Now the men waited for the sergeant's signal to light the box fire. The flames crept closer and closer, their hot breath reaching toward the top of the ridge. Still, the sergeant waited. Finally, he felt the suction from the fire drawing the air down the slope, and he gave the command. Now, let's fire to the underbrush. Backfire was lit along the ravine side of the trench. A tiny, wavering line of flames at first. Then it began to move faster and faster, drawn by the suction the great fire was creating. And soon there was a patch of burnt ground all along the top of the ravine. It widened. Six feet, ten feet, twenty feet. And finally the margin of safety had been achieved. The men on the ridge stood motionless. Their faces slackened with soot, but smiling as they watched the fire burn itself out down the slope. The sergeant and king made their way through the trees to the spring. Pierre and Silk were talking, and the sergeant stopped short to listen. Quiet, boy. You ain't been paid for you. Set the fire. Think I'd have been caught down there for the chimney? I'm not a chimney, you, you big ox. Uh, I was looking for the others. Well, I hit my head on a rock. When I came to, I couldn't walk. My ankle. I had to crawl up that ravine. It would have been a good thing if we had left you down there. Who burned? That's just what Corgan and the others did. They knew I was somewhere around. They didn't even look for me. I'll get even, though. What's well, Corrigan and his men who set the fire? Yeah, that's government's land. I'll turn witness for the Crown against them. What good is this on that? We stopped it by our... Maybe. What do you suppose has happened back at your camp while you're playing fire? Huh? Get off! Corrigan will burn it. Why should he? All you have to do is push him into the creek. They'll float down into the Yukon, and from there on past Dawson all the way to the sea. What's the stop? Turn on Paxton! I'm right here, Pierre. I heard everything he said. He'll get his chance to testify for the Crown. The logs. Well, look, I'll build into a right. I know, but Corrigan hasn't tried anything yet, or we'd have heard shooting from the camp. Wait! Ask the men to come over here! Right. Meanwhile, at the camp, Duke Curtis, always impatient, was pacing the floor of the mess cabin. Sam Warren, the other man who'd been left behind, tried to calm him down. Stands the reason someone had to stay behind, Duke. But why? What's going to happen here? I know as much about fighting fires as anyone in this camp. And you're also one of the best shots. Uh, what's there to shoot at? Let's hope there'll be nothing. The smoke seems to be thinning out a little bit. I can almost see the creek bank. Hey, that's what we should be doing, patrolling the bank. All right. Anything to make you happier? Let's go. All right, good. Quiet, isn't it? All the birds and animals have cleared out. Yeah. Come on, boys. Hey, what was that? Someone down with the log pile. Come on. Duke, there's half a men down there. Oh, Look, they see us. Play with your gun. Why are you thieving fire? Shoot at me, will you? Duke, take cover. I'll show him. No. Duke, you've been hit. Corrigan and one of his henchmen headed up the bank toward the two fallen men. Duke's eyes opened. He saw Corrigan. Oh. His fingers tried to grasp his gun just uh. beyond his reach. But in the next second, Corrigan's boot connected solidly with his jaw. <coughs> Corrigan, this is murder. Hey, I said, but even if they die, who's to know that we're responsible? Now go on, get back to those logs and start jumping them in a creek. Hey, Corrigan, there's a man heading this way. Hey, the crew's coming back. Yeah. I'm looking downstream. Let's get out of here. Let's scream, Luke. Come on. Yeah. Corrigan and Luke raced across the camp, clearing and into the woods. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Hey, fall! Say, have you had the thrill lately of being right there in the ballpark when the leadoff man steps up to the plate? Have you been there to see the star players in person? See them wallop home runs? See the exciting double plays? Well, don't miss the fun another day. Come out to the ball game as guest of a major or minor league team. Walk right through the gate free if you are 12 years or younger and bring mom or dad or another paying adult. Yes, you can get a free baseball ticket. No mailing, no waiting. 
It's right inside a package of Quaker Pop wheat or Quaker Pop rice or Muffet shredded wheat. Or buy Quaker Paco 10 and get two free baseball tickets. Names of teams and dates are on every ticket. Hurry to get your free baseball ticket in the special package of Quaker Pop wheat or rice, Muffet shredded wheat, or Quaker Paco 10. to continue. Corrigan and Luke had gone less than 100 feet upstream and away from the creek when a silvery shape loomed ahead of them. A wolf! No, it's a dog. It's a mountain dog. It's King. Oh! Oh! King sprang aside and disappeared among the trees as he saw the pistol leveled at him. Corrigan changed his direction and ran on. But less than a minute later, he saw King ahead of him again. Oh! Why are you? He opened fire. Once more, King ducked in time. Corrigan looked wildly around and changed his direction a second time. But now King's barking seemed to keep pace with him. Yet it was impossible to see the dog. Corrigan fired at the sound of the barking. King answered with a growl. Now Corrigan's gun was empty. Forget about the dog. Come on. Oh, you follow us. We'll never get away unless we stop him. You'll never get away, hey, hey, look, Corrigan. I can press with your hands, both of you. It's good work, Sergeant. King, tell us where Corrigan is every minute. And now we find him with his gun empty. It'll be of no use to him, though. I'll take it, Corrigan. You're under arrest in the name of the Crown. I've broken no law. The first charge is arson. And they caught up in the camp that you have shoot Sam and Duke. Cut me. It was this man who shot him. That's a lie. I tried to stop him. I warned him. Never mind the talk. You're both under arrest and the charge may be murder. Not one of Corrigan's gang escaped. But the camp was tense with anxiety all that night. For though Sam responded quickly to the sergeant's first aid, Duke's eyes remained closed. And when Bert asked for a word of encouragement, the sergeant could only shake his head. The rafts were assembled the following day. And that night, the sergeant suggested an immediate start for Dawson. Sure, sergeant. There's nothing to keep us here now. We'll get Duke to a hospital as quickly as possible. Right. Tip on the raft won't hurt him. We'll take him aboard cotton all. Yes, sergeant. The first raft, you'll be handling the sweep, won't you? Yes, and I suppose you want the prisoners on board that raft, too. Yes, sir. I'll pass the word along with the men. Later, the raft swung out from shore one by one. It was a silent journey down the Niora and into the Yukon. And all night long, the sergeant kept watch beside Duke's cot, while King kept an eye on the sleeping prisoners. Toward dawn, the sergeant noticed that Bert's head was drooping with weariness. I'll take over for a while, Bert. Oh, uh, oh, uh, well, thanks, sergeant. Is, he, is Duke still the same? I'll be seeing Dawson when they round the next bend. Won't be long before he's under a doctor's care. As if anyone could do more for him than you have. I know, Dawson. I remember the last time we were here, Jim Clark said, your men would die for you, Bert. And I said, I hope that won't happen. It makes it all so useless, Sergeant. Sure, I'll win the bonus. Sure, I'll develop my claim. What's the difference? I'm... I'm going to get every one of the men who worked for me in this job a, a share in the claim. But what will I do with Duke's share? For the next few minutes, the two men gave their attention to the river. The sergeant swung the raft around the last bend and headed toward the sawmill dock. The sun was rising over the eastern hills, and the sergeant noticed that King had changed his position, was now standing beside Duke's cot. The great dog looked toward his master. What is it, King? And then the sergeant saw Duke's head turn and his hand reach out to the fat king. Bert, Duke's conscious. Look. But Duke. I am what? You and the sergeant and king. Good company. And that Dawson up ahead. We're nearly home, boy. Yeah, but that's a mangy crew you have up in front. Corrigan and all his men. Do you know what they're trying to do? Yes, Duke. They're all under arrest. They're going to jail for arson and attempted murder. That sounds pretty good. We finish with our lumbering and they start out. How long will you give them on the wood pile, Sergeant? That'll be up to the judge, Duke, but I can imagine what his sentence will be. Twenty years of hard labor. And good riddance. All right. This case is closed. <laughs> Sergeant Preston will return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. 
Your musical treat of the day waits for you throughout the week on Mutual. Each Tuesday and Thursday evening, it's time for Eddie Fisher and a session of music as everyone likes it. Young and old delight in Eddie Fisher's wave of the song. And he's joined on every show by Fred Robbins as MC, Alex Stordo's orchestra, and outstanding guest stars. Every Saturday, the teenager's favorite, Johnny Desmond, brings phonorama time and a roundup of the newest and best in popular recordings. On Sundays, the Enchanted Hour presents favorite music from the world's best-loved composers. Every weekday also means time for Hawaii calls and authentic melodies of the islands. Music fills mutual there throughout the week. Hear the Eddie Fisher Show, Johnny Desmond with Phonorama Time, Enchanted Hour, and Hawaii Calls on Mutual throughout the week over most of these stations. Sergeant Preston reported to Inspector Conrad to learn the details of his next assignment. Constable Summers has gone to Lost Pine to investigate several trail robberies. Sergeant, I want you to join the constable. I think he'll need help. Very well, sir. Constable Summers has a brother living in Lost Pine. If you have any trouble locating the constable, look for Gary. He'll be able to tell you where to find Summers. Right, sir. Sergeant Preston doesn't know that Constable Summers is already dead, that his brother Gary is in hiding. If Preston succeeds in finding Gary, they'll both be hunted, for Gary Summers is marked for murder. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Adventures are brought to you every Monday through Friday at this time by the Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the delicious cereals shot from guns. By special recording in cooperation with the Mutual Broadcasting System. They are a copyrighted feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated. Created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, and directed by Fred Flowerday. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is Mutual, Radio Network for America. Thank you.